So no pressure then. Um, I have taken the liberty of putting some notes together because free talking plus jet lag is, is never a good combination. Um, but I'm, you know, in contrast to our really interesting discussions this afternoon, I'm coming back with that framework of engaging with individual research participants and engaging with academics in resource poor settings who often receive overseas public funding. So those, if you like, this, the stakeholders with whom we've been working. Um, so I think, you know, you're lucky. It's a nice environment you're working in. You've got a kaleidoscope of, of guidance and regulation. You've got 1,100 documents, some which conflict. Lacuna and some, as we see, particularly in Europe, undergoing a great deal of change at present. Um, and then you've got the relevant guidance and regulation, some down to the federal level. Um, and then you have the Ethics Committee and Institutional Review Board interpretation of the above. And an Ethics Committee review has been likened to a snowflake. No two committees will review you know, the same thing the same way. So you have this additional area of, of difference. Um, and then you have this variety within the, the subject matter that you're looking at, the stakeholders with whom you're engaging and the, the kinds of research and what they generate. So it was just to, to reflect on that very busy background against which you're in working, some with uh, very established methods and some with a great deal of variation. Um, I was asked yesterday, and I, I didn't respond, but this, this question of international relevance. Um, and just to report on methods that other groups have used when seeking to engage and produce internationally relevant principles. And I'm thinking here of the Declaration of Helsinki developed by WHO and the Nuffield and Enbeck reports seeking to provide international reflections on research ethics. Um, groups such as Nuffield had stakeholders from around the world on their working parties, uh, certainly with their review panels. Um, NBAC, for example, they commissioned research from a variety of settings to inform their material. Fact-finding meetings were held overseas and often, um, for example, I'm thinking for this context, something like EDCTP or something where you're bringing together a number of trialists from a number of countries, how you can piggyback on those kinds of meetings to get a range of views quite quickly, and then what kind of stakeholder involvement you want both in the drafting and in the review process. So just looking at methods that other groups have used. But to come back to this, this idea of bringing together some of the principles, and I haven't addressed all 11 uh, discussion points, um, in the areas that we've been working, to just say within these stakeholders, you know, this wonderful heterogeneity you have represented and the complexity of engaging with that. So if I look particularly at research participants, they have very different attitudes about the amount of information they want before decision making. Um, some simply, if you say, we want to share your data for research purposes, and they say, fine, and, and it's left at that. Others want a very precise, they might want this entire appendix, is it, is it my neighbour, is, you know, is it the med student next door who's going to be looking at it, why are they going to be looking for it, and how we can address those research interests. And they have very different views about the bundles of rights and responsibilities surrounding the data, and I'll come on to this in a minute, but this point that keeps coming up about the de-identification of data um, and what rights and responsibilities there may be around de-identified data. And they have very different views about sharing data, um, where lines might be drawn about what kinds of data are shared and wh what are acceptable research purposes, uh, to where it should go, who should use it, um, and what might constitute a misuse of data such that they would feel affronted, wronged. Um, and we had this discussion this morning about this lack of complaint and, and just to be aware that often there's also that lack of awareness. Um, and so, a, you know, a lack of complaint doesn't necessarily indicate acceptance, particularly uh, in, in lower resource settings where, you know, participants may not appreciate the extent to which their data is being shared, uh, but also here. If we're looking at the principles and mapping them onto your discussion points, um, if we're looking at your principle of maximizing value and use, and, but also that minimizing harm, it's, it's taking into a site, you were saying one of your questions was how do we look at this, this variety in this inconsistent framework? And often that approach is very useful because the, the guidance, if you like, is trying to make concrete some of these ethical principles and identifying where there is consensus and particularly, for example, Europe is providing a wonderful example where there is conflict and, and identifying where, if you like, these ethical principles are still being hammered out and negotiated, but where there is a, is a great deal of consensus is valuable. 
Um, with protecting privacy and confidentiality, we had you know, fascinating presentations earlier today about the methods of frameworks um, and, and need for enforcement and remedies. Um, the question, the take home question I have there is you know, how much does de identifying data do to change the rights and obligations regarding that data? Uh, that's in addition to the question of sometimes we may want data to be relatively identifiable because if we would remove some elements that are identifiable, the data set becomes less valuable. We had a, a big debate with the, the malaria gen study about including uh, ethnicity data. We felt that it was necessary to include because otherwise the noise in the data set would be such that it was not useful when it was being shared. But those debates that take place. So it's just to come back to that point. Here, there are some views from ethics committees we've heard express the discomfort, if you like, with the HIPAA framework that once it's de identified, we have no obligations, there are no rights and responsibilities from those that provide the data. So, how you might want to engage with that issue. Um, and the development of policies and processes, and that need for some form of contractual framework, often or, or agreement, if we're going to have those protections move through to various data users rather than perhaps an open access framework. Um, and then in addition to looking at the, your question about prioritization of sharing, what data should we try and prioritize for sharing, what might we prioritize for protecting, what might be sensitive, what might be of concern, and how, how are people going to phrase that? Um, we had the example yesterday of HIV, this morning of various kinds of psychological research. You know, what may or may not be sensitive, in addition and completely distinct from identifiable characteristics. Coming back to this, uh, this other area where there's potential conflict of the integrity of the data set versus respect for individual participants. So we can't use them merely as a means to an end. We need to provide them an opportunity to consent to research. Um, we had some discussion about notification and cramming this morning. I mean, typically at its basis, all consent for clinical trial is a notification. You don't get to choose. You either opt in or you opt out. And so one of the questions here might be, how do we think of data sharing as different from the other options we, we offer to opt in or opt out? Um, and if we're going to treat it somehow differently, why would we do so? And one of the areas might be the unknowns. We cannot offer any specificity here. Um, but on the other hand, we have unknowns in clinical trials. We, that's why we're running them. We're trying to address questions. So to just think about why we, if we need to treat uh, data sharing differently from other forms of information, and if so, why, and the acceptability of having broad forms of consent here. Um, and coming back down to then, it gives implications for how we prioritize giving data to participants, you know, how much we need to focus on data sharing in addition to other forms of research uh, information we give them about the study. In practice, we always prioritize what's given to participants. Why do we prioritize it and how do we do so? Where should data sharing fit into that framework? Um, and this is coming back to this idea of whether we need uh, to how we consult with participants, um, the extent to which we need to. We've had some discussion about uh, community boards, um, communal decision making about what might be appropriate in forms of data sharing, when we might need to put categories in place. So that rather than just asking for broad consent, participants are given the opportunity to limit some of the things that they're involved with and how that might be arrived at. Um, and then just very finally, those comments that were came up very strongly in the previous session about sharing data uh, and fairness um, and the incentives and protections and responding to imbalances. Um, those requirements for researchers with limited resources in lower and middle income settings that need for a process for data sharing to be trustworthy and transparent, not necessarily, it's very valuable to pull resources to share data, to have data sharing hubs. But if you're crossing geographical boundaries, what are the implications of those? Can you host them within regions? Um, is that appropriate? So the resources needed, particularly when you have staff recruited on a trial by trial basis, having people available to answer questions, what you might need to put in place to do that, and the capacity building to even be able to respond to, to international questions and have the resources available to do so. And finally, uh, questions about the delay timing 
about the release of data and the extent to which you might take local resources into account when you're looking at delays. So not just tying it to publication or a decision event, but simply recognising that the capacity to analyse the data in a particular setting will be such that it would be appropriate to give that setting a, a, a period of time to work with that data before they're required to share it and potentially getting scooped by overseas researchers. And there's one of the things we did with Malaria Gen. We, no we negotiated a nine month delay on the release of genome wide association data. And it was interesting, uh, you know, discussions with the NIH. It was like, well, if we'd been funding that, you wouldn't have been allowed to do that. And it's like, yes, funded, we were funded with the Wellcome Trust and the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the different negotiations that can take place. So just that need for flexibility to be able to respond to these ranges of environments. We've talked about ranges of data sharing models, uh, ranges of concern models, you know, these frameworks, so that we don't necessarily set the, the hard and fast rules that have the, the unintended consequences in all cases. Thank you.